All right, it's finally time to move on to tier five. And I feel like tiers five and six are where you can really start to go a bit crazy with the abilities. Uh, that being said, there are a lot of pets in both these two tiers where uh, I'm really not sure on some of the, the numbers. So feel free to just imagine those numbers going up or down to your own taste, depending on how strong you think the various pets are. So we'll start with the foods again. And uh, tier five, we only have one new food. We've got chocolate, of course, and uh, sushi as well. And the food I've gone for here is passion fruit. Gain plus 12 health when stats are removed once. So this is really to cover something that's kind of been bothering me for a while, that we have a lot of pets now that can remove stats uh, where you can't really defend against it. So we've got, you know, Urchin, Skunk, Cali Greyhound and Kraken. And Kraken is probably the number one offender at the moment. But I feel like it would be perfectly fair to have a perk which can be consumed and will refill some of your health if you get hit by one of these pets. And of course, we also have the Echidna on uh, tier four. So, you know, having some kind of counterplay to just having all your health removed seems like it would be pretty fair to me. And similarly, we actually have an attack version on tier five. So the Fennec Fox, before battle, detect snipe, remove 25% attack from the highest attack enemy, if not 10% from all enemies. So this is kind of like a, a combination of two different pets. It's like the a, an attack version of the skunk, uh, if you detect a snipe opponent, or it's like an attack version of the kraken, if not. And I think re attack reduction is also something that has been sorely missing from the game for a long time. And uh, of course, because of the sniping pets like Leopard, it needs to be before battle for this to actually work. But there are a lot of pets now in the game as well that have um, abilities that scale based on high attack. So, you know, Leopard powers up the higher the attack is. Cobra powers up higher the attack is. There are a bunch of others as well. And there's really not much you can do to defend against them. You know, stuff like Leopard especially is going to go off at the start of battle no matter what. So if you have level 3 Leopard, level 3 Tiger, you're doing two rounds of 75 damage no matter what happens. Slightly different with Cobra because it needs other things to happen, but uh, ultra strong as well. And so I, I really wanted to add something that give you an option for um, reducing the damage from pets like uh, Leopard and Cobra, which are um, major beneficiaries of how easy it is to scale and level things these days. So if we're going to have a pet that removes attack, it's only fair that we have at least one that can also regain attack. And so we move on to uh, Carnotaurus. Enemy hurt, jump to the front and gain plus 10 attack, works one time per turn, and then it just uh, goes two and three times per turn at the higher levels. This one I, I'm not 100% sure on. I did have this a couple of different variations, one of them where it would only work once per turn and you just gain more attack at each level. But I feel like gaining higher attack on level three is kind of pointless because it's just going to, um, you know, you're going to end up in a situation where the attack is getting wasted. So I felt like having multiple triggers would uh, make more sense. Um, obviously, that would mean it interacts well, pretty favorably with uh, Frogman at the high level. But um, yeah, I feel like Frogman's probably going to get adjusted anyway. And this pet serves a few purposes other than just, um, you know, having something to counter the Fennec Fox. It does give you an option to try and remove large hurt pets. You know, we have multiple hurt pets on the previous tiers. I guess it gives you the option to remove any large sweeping pet at the front quite quickly. But the enemy hurt trigger also means that there's possibilities for interacting with the opposing team in a variety of ways. So for instance, you could play the uh, Snowy Owl, you know, level two Snowy Owl doing two snipes would mean at level two Carnotaurus would be able to activate twice straight away. But the other reason for having this enemy hurt trigger is that uh, I wanted to have an interaction with Crisp. So if we have Crisp on one of our own units at the back, and uh, there's a clash at the front that's going to end up triggering enemy hurt twice. Uh, possibly could be more than twice, depending on if there are um, perks involved as well. And therefore, you could actually bait this to happen, make this unit waste all of its triggers at once. Maybe at tier five, you would think that it would be fair enough to give this some health as well. But uh, I feel like with um, Pita Bread available, you know, you don't want to make it uh, too crazy of a sweeper. And speaking about Pita Bread, next up on the list is the Spoon Bill. So friend lost perk, copy this pet's food perk to them, works one time per turn. And this ability has actually been in a couple of other videos from other channels. I'll link them in the description, uh, or at least something very close to it. But I think this is a pretty obvious ad, and it's kind of a combination of seagull and crane. 
And I did mention with the bullfrog that I really wanted more seagull-like abilities. So in this context, losing a perk would mean that it had been consumed. For So pita bread, passion fruit, uh, dragon fruit, or any of the perks that have one or two uses. And although this is a very strong utility pet, I think it compares favorably with Crane. Crane clearly can give a melon, which is pretty much one of the best perks in the game. And that effect is going to go off regardless of whether or not the crane itself has a weakness. Here it's kind of higher risk, higher reward, in that the Spoonbill could end up losing its perk through snipes or through um, application of ailments, and in which case it's going to end up doing very little in the battle. Of course, it doesn't take much imagination to work out that you can also use this in the shop with pets like the Red Wolf that are dealing uh, damage to teammates. So you could have the Spoonbill dishing out uh, pita bread, and then helping your own teammates gain health that way. And that leads us into the Orchid Mantis. So adjacent pet gained perk, deal four damage to it and gain plus two attack, plus two health. Works once in shop, twice in battle. So this is a variation on the Mantis. The difference here is that it's not an instant knockout. And actually on the test server, Mantis has been changed to deal actual damage rather than automatically knocking pets out. But each uh, level up increases the amount of damage dealt and we always only gain plus two two. So this is kind of designed to serve a similar role to the Mantis, but also a little bit different. We, If we have pets like the Spoonbill, and also there are gonna be some other ones later on as well, opposing pets gaining strong perks, you know, we want to have a way to counter that. And the Mantis is gonna provide that, that we can immediately deal damage to them if they gain a perk in battle. And of course you can think about things like a Turtle in Turtle Pack or a Tar in a Puppy Pack. But again, much like the Red Wolf, we can use this to trigger uh, pita bread in the shop. Although the uh, further down the line we go, the less value we're going to get out of it. So it is kind of a double-edged sword. All right, here's an example heart build on the right using the Mantis and the Spoonbill. And on the left, we have a very familiar looking team with the Arctic Fox and Woolly Rhino. So no start of battle, the Mantis is going to knock out the Arctic Fox. So we gain cold on the Rhino. Now the Mantis would have been hurt there, so that would actually trigger the Bullfrog. So we're gonna gain ink at the front here. The Rhino's Snipe is gonna go off and hit the Pom Pom Crab at the back, which is gonna result in another uh, Bullfrog trigger. So we're gonna gain ink over here. But let's say that there's no chain reaction. Now on this side, the cold gets replaced by Chili because of the tar. And that means that the Rhino has gained a perk. So the Mantis ability is gonna go off it's going to deal damage to the rhino and gain some stats itself, which kind of makes up for the ink. So now when the rhino and the mantis clash, the chili is actually going to set off the pita bread on the echidna here. So the pita bread gets removed, the echidna gains a bunch of health, it removes some health from the opponent because of its ability. And now this pet has lost a perk. So the spoonbill is going to copy the dragon fruit onto the echidna. But if we assume that Spoonbill and uh, Bullfrog is going to work the same way as Crane and Toad, actually what would happen here is if the Bullfrog had any triggers left, the Dragon Fruit would immediately be replaced by Ink. But let's assume it's just a level 1 Bullfrog. And that means that uh, we're also going to trigger Adjacent Pet Gained again. And the Mantis is going to attack its teammate, trigger the Hurt ability, and trigger the Dragon Fruit. Alright, so we fleshed out the Hurt mechanics a little bit more. Now we need to flesh out the eject mechanic. So next up is the Barracuda. Two friends ejected, gain plus two attack and plus two health, half if cold. So very similar ability to the shark, but because this is eject instead of faint, I felt like it really had to be two friends. Clearly there are a lot of pets in the game already that weren't really designed with uh, an eject mechanic in mind. If you think about something like Leviathan, if you just put Leviathan on your team and uh, field a normal five squad, Leviathan is going to be triggering uh, four ejects at the end of a turn. So you would permanently gain a plus four four just from a level one Barracuda. But I also kind of like Vulture and Grizzly, you know, the pets that have delayed reaction effects where they have to count a certain number of times before their ability goes off. I think it just makes battles feel more interesting overall. And then lastly, I wanted a little bit more interaction with Cold. I did mention in the other video that uh, Cold was originally the only um, ailment in the pack. So maybe you need to think a little bit more about just placing the Barracuda at the back of the team, especially since you can trigger eject at the start of battle. So there will definitely be times where it would make more sense to actually play it quite close to the front. 
And then to pair with the Barracuda, we move on to the Basking Shark. And this combines a bunch of my favorite pets in the game. Knockout, swallow the knocked out pet and release it as level one after fainting. Triggers two times. And then we get uh, four times and six times at the higher levels, but always level one. So this is kind of a dual purpose ability. We can set this up to work for both summon and eject. So you could play a big um, basking shark right at the front, have it swallow a bunch of opposing pets, um, and then try and release them all when it faints, but there's not gonna be any space because you're at the front, which would result in a bunch of eject triggers. But you could also play it further back and then have it release a bunch of level one pets after fainting and just play it as a traditional kind of summon pet. And again, this is similar to the tape here in that it's um, copying pets from the opposing team. I feel like uh, Falcon is one of those pets that can just create the most fun interactions where you get unlikely combos because the Falcon copied something from uh, outside the current pack. So next we'll look at the Moon Moth. And I feel like a lot of the insects don't tend to be high tier pets. So I felt like this one, especially since the artwork is just absolutely gorgeous, that it should be a high tier pet. So it is end turn. If turn number is even, give adjacent pets random ailments and plus two attack and plus three health. So essentially we're getting the exact same amount of uh, buffs as the Mosasaurus and it's on um, alternating turns. So I I exactly the same stat output. The only difference is we don't actually have the requirement of having a toy on the team, but we are instead giving two of our pets random ailments. And we already know there are ways to take advantage of that with the bullfrog. Um, also, you know, the box jellyfish, but principally the reason for this ability was to give the bullfrog access to the other ailments that are not crisp, cold, and ink. And the fact that it's random, I felt like that was fair enough. You know, the, some of the other ailments are very powerful, like um, exposed and uh, dazed. But I think at this point there are seven ailments in the game, and I'm sure there probably will be more. So, you know, your odds of getting one of those top ailments isn't going to be the greatest. And you could end up getting uh, spooked which uh, clearly is a bit of a downgrade on some of these others. You could also play this multiple turns in order to get the ailment that you want on the bullfrog and then just get rid of the moon moth. But of course, then you're foregoing some of the best scaling that uh, the higher tiers have to offer. So following the ailment thread, we're going to move on to the comb jelly. And this is a pet that's had a bunch of different abilities. In fact, a few of these have all had different abilities. I'll discuss them at the very end in the wrap up video. But uh, eventually I settled on this one, which someone did actually mention in the comments. Ailment effects are reversed for this pet. And then they become twice as effective and three times affected at the higher levels. So this is like a positive version of the Manticore. Now Manticore does affect the entire opposing team, whereas this would only affect itself. I think um, making ailments like completely pointless for the entire team would be way too strong. And this has a whole bunch of different roles. First of all, it's just basic counterplay for the ailment spreaders on the opposing teams like uh, Bullfrog and um, Snowy Owl. But also it's going to allow you to uh, use the Moon Moth without any penalty. So, you know, you're taking ailments onto your Comb Jelly, but they're going to be reversed. So they're actually going to have a positive effect in most cases. I think the only example would be uh, Dazed, which doesn't really make any sense when it's reversed, but everything else otherwise would be uh, positive. So this is kind of the ideal partner pet for the ailment archetype. You know, it's going to work with the Moon Moth, the Bullfrog, the uh, box jellyfish. It's kind of anti-synergistic with the uh, cleaner ras, but um, you know you don't want to always have to have this pet to be able to buy ailments from the shop. So that kind of leaves the oddballs left. We've got the red panda here, which we'll go to first. And this one has had different abilities as well, but I settled on end turn. If this is your only red panda, give the leftmost shop pet plus one attack, plus one health, and plus one experience. So this combines a bunch of things together that I really like. You know, I love the dromedary effect uh, shop scaling. I like the idea of uh, Doberman and Lion, that they have powerful abilities, but you can only ever take one of them for them actually to work. In fact, I think this uh, concept of, you know, if this is your only should really be applied to quite a few other pets in order to, um, you know, make it easier to balance them while also giving them fun and powerful abilities. And with Unicorn Pack, Griffin actually made it possible to have pets in the shop that have higher than just level one. And so I think it makes sense that we could actually start just applying experience to pets in the shop. And oftentimes that can be a problem if you're trying to run uh, shop scaling where you're, you're scaling something up and you're holding it for so long, but when you bring it into your team, it's only a level one. And maybe at first glance, the amount of stats here doesn't seem all that great for a tier five. But uh, you have to remember that um, plus one experience is the same as plus one one. So this is actually giving 
uh, plus two two overall on top of the experience. But yeah, I think the most important thing for me was having more interactions with shop pets that are not solely based on giving stats. And that just leaves the very odd looking sea fan. Friend summoned, if in battle, give it plus five attack, plus five health, and Conpeto works two times per turn. And then we get extra stats on levels two and three. So this is giving the maxed out level of buffs from a level one Jersey Devil. However, it can only do it twice per turn and it's only in battle. So basically the same trigger condition as the flying fish, but we're giving a lot more stats and we're increasing the tier of the pet by one. So clearly this would uh, be very useful for stacking. You know, you could end up uh, creating um, much higher tier summons by applying Competo multiple times in battle. So this combines a bunch of things that I, I really like. You know, a lot of uh, summon teams, you'll have the strong summon support pet at the back that just gives stats. And then the loot box pets will tend to be, you know, your eagles, your orcas. But this allows you to have the summon support actually providing the loot box aspect. And so you can start using a bunch of different existing summon pets in more interesting ways. Now, there probably would need to be some slight adjustments in the game mechanics already. If you're not aware, a lot of the existing token pets are always tier one. And I think that's something that could be adjusted. Um, it really only affects the Rhino ability. And we've got a bunch of tokens here already. Imagine we actually just set them to specific tiers instead of saying that they were all tier one. So maybe a Scarlet Macaw could be a tier three, in which case giving it Competo is gonna turn it into one of these tier fours. I think it's pretty easy to imagine lots more interesting interactions if you didn't just have tier ones being turned into tier two. All right, here's a very, very simple example team with the sea fan. So start of battle, the pie goes off first, giving extra stats to Dilophosaurus here, which is gonna affect the summon pets that it uh, brings in. We've got the Fennec Fox at the back. So before battle, detect snipe. There aren't any snipe pets on this side. So it's gonna remove um, attack from all three units. Now you probably don't care about it being removed from the sea fan, but removing it from Dilophosaurus is actually going to affect the stats of the summoned units as well. Then we have Snowy Owl, probably this late in the game it's going to be level 2 or higher. So it's actually going to deal snipe damage to two random enemies. So immediately the Carnotaurus ability is going to activate and cause it to uh, jump to the front and uh, gain extra attack, which kind of makes sense because this is probably going to be our biggest unit and it would be nice for this team to get rid of it in one go. But now the Dilophosaurus goes, so it's actually gonna summon some buddies to fill the gaps, but the sea fan is gonna give extra stats plus Competo. And since we have two of them, it's actually gonna move these up two tiers. Now I'm not gonna reveal any of the tier six abilities, but you know I think you can already imagine from things like Eagle that it can often be very beneficial getting a large tier six unit spawning on your side. So let's just drag a couple of them in and uh, you can just imagine what their abilities are for now. So that's it for tier five. Next time we'll look at the final tier, which in theory should be the most powerful pets in the pack.